गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स इट गिव्स मी ग्रेट प्लेजर इन इंट्रोड्यूसिंग टू स्पीकर्स दिस आफ्टरनून फर्स्ट स्पीकर इज शिखर अग्निहोत्री हु नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन टू दिस ऑडियंस ही इज लाइक द ग्रेट बैनियन ट्री एट आडियार डूइंग सॉलिड वर्क presently volunteering at adyar shikhar holds a bachelor's degree in nautical science he worked in shipping court industry for 10 years then voluntarily retired he joined the theosophical society in 2008 because of his mother's influence who has been a member since 1980s thanks to mrs agnihotri for being a role model he has been a founder member of pragya ts lodge and maitri tos group in lucknow he has been assigned as a national lecturer of indian section since 19 2015 he is in more interested in practical implementation of theosophy in daily life recently got married and right now um working in adyar theosophical academy at international headquarters of the theosophical society he has conducted study camps and youth camps for the indian section at various places in india mr agnihotri ah. sorry uh, he is going to talk on who is nurturing whom गुरूर ब्रह्म गुरूर विष्णु गुरूर देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम डियर एंड रिस्पेक्टेड चेयरपर्सन ऑफ द सेशन माइ को स्पीकर एंड डियर एंड रिस्पेक्टेड ब्रदरन i am going to speak today on a topic which is related to the theme nurturing the divine seed and the title is as jashri ji mentioned who is nurturing whom very often whenever the word nurturing is mentioned the image of a nurturer and the one being nurtured appears in front of the mind which implies that there is a giver and a receiver and this aspect of the relationship is so evident in the world around us that very often the nurturer or the giver is credited with undue importance not realizing that the giver is just a medium through which the karma of the receiver is being fructified and the deeper aspect of this relationship is overlooked and what is the deeper aspect of this relationship to find that we need to look into not just the literal meaning of the word seed but also we have to go into the mystical and allegorical meaning of the word seed that is attached to the word seed a word that is used so commonly in day to day life a word that is full of mystery and impregnated with occultism what is a seed literally speaking it is the unit of reproduction of a flowering plant capable of reproducing another unit of itself but to go a little deeper 
Let me share with you an ex excerpt from Chandog Upanishad, uh, conversation between a father and a son, who are talking more like a teacher and a student. There is a reference in Chandogya Upanishad when Sage Uddalak has sent his son Shwet Ketu to study into a Gurukul as was the practice in India long back. Even him, he himself was a good teacher but he sent his son to another teacher to study. After 12 years of learning, Shwet Ketu returns home. And his father Sage Uddalak was wise enough to see something else with co which comes along with a lot of learning or information which is pride and so he wanted to make Shwet Ketu understand the difference between the information and the real knowledge or what we call wisdom so when he returns his father asked him I know you have learned a lot but have you learned that knowledge by knowing which everything else is known? This simple question humbled Shwet Ketu and he realized the limitation of the learning that he has received and he immediately with utmost request to his father who is now becoming his teacher asked that no, I have never heard of any such knowledge but will you please teach me? And his father said, yes. And he told him to bring a fruit of a banyan tree. So he brings, he asked him, he asked him to break it open. So Shwet Ketu broke the fruit and he asked him, what do you see inside? And he said, there are a lot of inf small, small seeds inside. Then he asked him, okay, take out one seed and break it. So Shwet Ketu took one seed and since it is very small seed with much difficulty he split it open and then he says there is nothing here and then his father asked him do you think that such marvel of a tree can come out of nothing? Only you are not able to see the subtle essence in the seed from which this banyan tree has come up. That which is the subtle essence is the basis of all existence. That which is the finest essence, the whole universe has that as its soul. That is the reality, that is the self, that is you, Shwet Ketu. So, the deeper aspect is that the seed in itself is a microcosm having the blueprint of its evolution which is not visible to our physical eyes and although we may wish to think that I can nurture the seed but the seed comes with its own plan of evolution and every event in this journey acts as a lesson or as a nurturing as per the law of nature. It is just like when a baby is born. Milk is available for the baby in the mother and when the milk is no more needed, the milk disappears. Although the modern science or modern medicine will say the reason is because of hormones or glands or something else, but the question still stays whence the wisdom comes which tells the glands or hormones to do certain changes in the body do we do something really special to make that happen no it is just a natural process to be witnessed with patience and any kind of unwise interference will only cause long-term harm to the mother and the baby both. So the seed, the baby who is about to be born already makes the arrangements in accordance with the law of karma. And we think that we are doing something for our children. And since this 
giving and receiving relationship, we see it like that, the sense of attachment and possession comes in. And maybe that's why the Lebanese philosopher, poet Khalil Gibran says about the children, the nurtured and the parents, the one who thinks, who are nurturing, he says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of the life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. You are the bow from which your children are sent forth as living arrows. The archer sees the mark upon the infinity and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrows that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. So basically, the word seed is used very well beyond its literal meaning. And fundamentally, it implies the energy in a potential form which has the possibility to expand and grow, but within the limitations created on its own, as per the law of harmony, law of retribution, of law of cause and effect, whatever we want to call it. And if we look from this aspect, everything in this manifested world, or even the whole world itself, is a seed. And maybe that is why there is a very significant and allegorical word given to this manifestation by the wise people of old times. And that word in Sanskrit is Brahmand, the egg of Brahman, which implies that this whole world collectively, along with everything in it individually, from a dust particle to the Logos, everything and everyone is evolving. And this evolution process itself is the nurturing of each and every entity in any given system. But this nurturing is not always in the way that we may wish to think it is. It is not just about providing more and more comforts to the entity in question, but bringing about a balance between exertion and rest, just like the days and nights of Brahma at a higher level. This nurturing is in the way of never having to interfere with the free will of the individual in the evolution process, so that the essential divine nature awakens in the individual and he or she becomes more and more aware of his essential divine nature, and till then, let the things be governed by the ultimate law of harmony, aiding the deserving individual as and when possible through different mediums. All of this is easily understood when it is happening outside. But what happens when it comes to the inner life of an individual? Because when we say, nurturing the divine seed, the two inquiries or implications immediately arise. It invokes the inquiry, who am I then? Because if I am going to nurture the divine seed, who am I then? Does it not imply that I am different from the divine seed? We shall talk about it in a while, but before that, let's just go to the second implication, which will, which will lead us to the first, and the second inquiry that arises is, who is nurturing whom? Because who is the nurturer and the nurtured within us? And the clarity comes when we study the septenary constitution of a human being in theosophy. And I am sure that all of us who have studied theosophical literature at some point of time must have come across 
the very scientific, the very logical, very lucid explanation of the constitution of a human being. That there are two entities working behind this physical appearance of ours, which we can give or we have studied, we can give various names like the lower quaternary and the upper imperishable triad, the animal soul, the spiritual soul, the Hindi equivalent of which can be named as Dehatma or Jivatma, or we can call them personality or individuality. But for now, let us keep it simple and limited to lower self and higher self, so that we are on a common ground. And as I understand, this higher self is the divine seed which is sown in the fields of physical, astral, and mental matter in general, and a physical, astral, and mental body in particular. We all study that before taking the birth, the incarnating self has a very clear picture of its journey till now, and the journey it is going to take in the upcoming birth. The pleasure and pain that it is going to face, and which past actions will have the fruition in the coming birth. So the whole journey is being planned by the divine seed, by us itself. But what happens is when the seed is sown in the body, and the human baby is born, all this memory goes in the backdrop. And the whole approach to life changes from, I am the spirit seed, and I am sown in an earthly body, to, I am the body, and I have a spirit seed. And from this basic assumption, belief or conditioning begins the whole cycle of illusion. And the first implication that we just mentioned, the query of who am I, comes into play. And when I think myself as a body, the natural consequence of it is that I try to nurture the divine seed. Not realizing that I have already created an impassable barrier between me and myself and converted a short journey into the longest one that I will ever take. Because is it really possible that the personality, the body, can nurture the spirit? But in the name of nurturing, what happens is the sense of I-ness strengthens. And to understand it better, I would like to share a mystical and paradoxical aphorism from Bhagavad Gita, which says, let him raise the self by the self, and not let the self become depressed. Because truly is the self, the friend of the self, and also the self is the self's enemy. Mind-boggling, isn't it? Let me read it once more with little modification. Let him raise the lower self by the higher self, and not let the lower self become depressed, because truly the higher self is the friend of the lower self, and also the higher self is the enemy of the lower self. And it is not difficult to find out that higher self is the friend of the lower self when the lower self, that is the body, desire, and mind, acts as an obedient instrument of the higher self, which is explained in the next aphorism by Sri Krishna himself, that the higher self is the friend of the lower self of him in whom the lower self is vanquished by the higher self. But to the unsubdued lower self, the higher self truly becomes hostile as an enemy. But again the question arises that if the higher self is guiding us, why do we not see it happening in our daily life? 
If the divine seed is guiding this whole plan, why so much chaos in the world? And the fundamental question to be asked is, at what point of the journey does this divine seed, the higher self, raise the lower? Because this journey is not of a recent origin. This journey began when the first time the unit of consciousness, the monad, separated, so to speak, not in reality, from the universal consciousness and descended down and passing through various kingdoms, elemental kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and coming to animal kingdom, a journey that has taken more time than we can imagine, not just on this planet, but on different globes, it arrives in human kingdom. And it is only in this human kingdom that the possibility of blossoming this divine seed arises. But having arrived in the human kingdom also, the divine seed has not much to interfere in the evolution because the instrument through which it has to work, the lower self is totally governed by the passions, emotions, ambitions and desires of its own and has developed in this long journey a strong sense of sense of separateness from the others. The question of conscious nurturing does not arise until the stage in evolution is reached when the higher self is able to impress itself upon the lower self in an effective manner. Until then, everything is governed by the law of cause and effect and the sense of a separate little self goes on strengthening. Whatever I do in the name of nurturing without awareness will only increase this sense of separateness because we all understand the ultimate, ultimately it is not about improving it is not about self-improvement, but about ending of the self, which is meant by the phrase spiritual self-transformation, mentioned in the mission statement of the Theosophical Society, and which is the true goal of every seeker of truth. And it is in this regard, I would like to share a memory of an interaction that happened many years ago. A well-known theosophist who now he is no more in the physical body who not just inspired many individuals to join the theosophical society out of which my mother is also one but many lodges of the societies formed wherever he visited. Swami Anand or Bhaiyaji as he was fondly addressed by most of the people who spent most of his time in the Himalayan center of the Theosophical Society, Bhavali, he used to speak very less. But every now and then some words of wisdom came out from his mouth for the people around him to gather. And it is in one such interaction when someone asked him, how, how can I improve my, or how to progress in my spiritual life? Which is the same question that we can say, what shall I do to nurture my divine seed? His simple reply was, what is there to do? Just see the things happen. Sounds very simple. And simple it is. Except the fact that it is a question of life and death for someone. Because the I-ness, the doership, does not feel comfortable at all with this concept of non-doing. Because this implies the death of I-ness. Because the I-ness is alive only due to this false belief that I, the personality, am the doer. 
And this gives me a sense of importance in this whole system. And it becomes a prize to be cherished because everyone around is doing the same. And no wonder that there is a race in the world to be in the important chair, to fill that bottomless pit of seeking self-importance. And it seems that if I have nothing to do, or if I think in the way of that there is nothing to do, how will this world go on? But actually what I am trying to say, if I am not doing anything, will I remain important? Why do people feel so depressed, not everyone, after retirement? Because they think that once they are working, stopped working, they have become unproductive. The uh, normal sense of the term, work has become, it's not the work, the sense of doership has become so important that it prevents us from realizing ourselves. But in fact, the work will happen even more efficiently because then the work will not be affected by our personal anxiety, competition, comparison, ambition, desire for recognition, etc., which are all the side effects of the sense of separateness. So the only nurturing that is needed is the breaking up of the conditioning of a sense of separate self. And the energy and intuition to break this shell will also come from the seed itself, as there is no fixed path for this. Because every human being is the path unto oneself, and every seed is the path unto itself. The effort can take an individual to a limit, and not beyond that. And the futility of self-centered effort has to be realized for the seed to express itself fully. And that is where the significance of non-judgmental awareness comes into play. Lives after lives are spent in this state of ignorance when one fine day, tired of this world of sorrow, the individual turns within and finds there a sense of peace which becomes the homing signal to help in taking the next step. But it is not until the awakening happens after a lot of inner struggle and turmoil that the realization dawns that I am not this, I am not this, I am not this. I am not a leaf, I am not a branch or a stem, not even the root, but the seed itself from which everything comes. All of this seems very arduous and hard work and time taking, but I would like to end this talk with an optimistic statement by a famous scholar, poet, Sufi mystic, Rumi, and he says, have you ever seen a seed fallen to earth not rise with a new life? Why should you doubt the rise of a seed named human? Thank you. Thank you, Shika. Our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. Esteban Langua. He is a member of Argentinian section since 18, 1983. Physician by profession and graduated in 1991. He has specialized in internal medicine. He is now the director of hospital Italiano San Justo in Argentina. He became the general secretary of the Argentinian section in December 2016. He has worked in different positions 
diffusing theosophy and in education field. He has traveled to various theosophical lodges, not only in Argentina, but also in Central and South America and Europe. He has participated in four international conventions as a delegate, as well as a speaker. Dr. Esteban Langua on continuous dissatisfaction and the useless, useless pursuit of happiness. Good afternoon. Um, as Rashi told uh, you, I am from Argentina. And um, some months ago, Maria, our international secretary, asked me to accept to deliver a short lecture in this convention. And when she asked me, I hesitated a little about accepting or not. And I, I share my concern with one of my theosophical mates in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And he said to me, why are you hesitating? Well, perhaps I feel not comfortable in doing a lecture in English that is obviously not my mother tongue, and I do not master the language too much. And despite I, I have given a couple of lectures in the past in English, I'm not too satisfied with the, with the work I have done. And he answered me, well, but you deliver uh, many uh, lectures in Spanish in Argentina all the years. And despite they are in Spanish, they are very bad. So your job in English wouldn't be worst. So torture them, not only to us. Well, with this suggestion, I accepted the challenge. So here, we are, here I, I am. I choose the title of the continuous in, insatisfaction and the useless pursuit of happiness because, because I think it's a very practical approach, uh, modern, related with our, our everyday life from very ancient uh, teachings. I um, will tell you a short story related with my life to make you perhaps follow more easily this talk and not to get asleep. When, uh, well, I, I was born in, a, in an ordinary family, not, uh, I'm not son of theosophists, so I pursued some regular education, but my family had some expectations about me and their main concern were to educate me to be able to have a good job and a good economical and social position. So, uh, since I was very little, I was encouraged to follow the studies, what I did, first in grammar school, high school, college, and always there was a goal to achieve. Hmm? So, I finished the first step, the grammar school, then the high school, then came the college school, and when each goal was accomplished, a new goal um, appeared be, uh, before me to, to be achieved also. So I was unable to enjoy really any goal um, acquired because there was a new challenge to become. And when I finished my medical studies, I was satisfied, but that satisfaction only lasted one day because I was um, 
concern about finding a job and finishing a um, medical specialty. And when I was ongoing those things, and in a quite successful way, I felt that I was incomplete and I wanted a family. So I married my girlfriend and we started together a family. But we were not complete, we needed to have children. So we did. And to have a family, we needed to have a house, a place, a nice place we are living. And we did. And when children came, the house was not uh, large enough. So we got a, a, a larger one. Uh, and so many things appear as a need after each goal we accomplished. And I'm telling you about the nice way. Everything flow apparently well, but never I had the time or the moment to truly enjoy what I had. With the children, it was the same thing. I was happy, as I am, my daughter is there, uh, with my children, but since they, are where they were born, I was worried about uh, uh, um, something uh, um, unfortunate can come to them. Illness, uh, failure in the school, um, pro psychological problems I could bring as a father, uh, a concern as, uh, um, about not being a good, in, uh, a good father enough, and the fear of, for them not to accomplish our expectation as fathers, as parents. So, I can tell you, 50 and some years after my birth, that I have lived a life of unsatisfaction, not because lack, uh, not having valuable things, but because never was anything enough. And when I took a moment to think about the things that I really have, I was possessed by the fear of that ha something happened and I could lose what I have. And I think that my personal story is quite the same of the majority of you and the majority of the humankind, because the nature of the humankind is at least at this moment, in this 25, 20, excuse me, 21st century, the, is guided by the paradigm of always something else. You have to go get something else always, because otherwise you will be not progressing. We invented the word progressing as synonym of adding things, stocking things, material things, emotional things, sentimental things, intellectual things, social things, but objects of different kinds. And in this passion for accumulation, we passed our entire life. And, because, and perhaps we grow old, we have no more goals to achieve because we feel our life is finished, but still there is the afraid of having not done a good job and the things, and that the things that we care can uh, deteriorate, be lost, or uh, that something unfortunately can arrive to them. So, um, well, all of you are theosophists, so you are aware that not life is only physical, mental, and emotional um, things. The whole world has other dimensions, uh, let's call them spiritual, and we are all trying to live in that spiritual world. Hmm? We will come to this, but a few days ago, I went to Sarnath, 
near here, all of, or most of you may know the place, where is marked uh, the, the ex exact place where Buddha gave his first sermon after uh, getting the enlightenment, after becoming a Buddha, to his ancient five uh, mates of a uh, spiritual search that become immediately their disciples or um, pupils. And in that first sermon, he explained with very similar words what was the very deep problem of humankind. And he called that, I don't know if it was he who called that, but later the monks called that the first noble truth of pain, of suffering, of dukkha in Pali. You can correct me if I am wrong. And in that first declaration of um, that life is suffering because of continual insatisfaction, he said that there is the spiritual world, he used other terms, but I am transliterating the concept to the theosophical language, of the permanent, of the everlasting, of the unborn. That means the state of the pure consciousness or the spirit with the lighter, so to say, veil of matter. And that if we focus our attention in that world and not in the ever-changing objects we can accumulate, this suffering will be diminished and something that we could call happiness could arrive. Well, it's easy to say, let's so focus to the spiritual, to the permanent, to those very high states of consciousness, so we will not suffer anymore. That's all. That is the receipt. We all know, we are theosophists. But why we cannot do this? Why are, you, are we dry, driven so strongly to the accumulation process, to the endless um, thirst of things? Well, in one of the following truths that uh, Buddha revealed or taught to his pupils that day was that the question was that humans are uh, driven by the, the, um, an element that he called tanha in Pali. That means, or can be translated in English to desire, thirst to have things. That is, the, um, the, that is what impels us, what propels us to the life and, get, and, and make us um, wanting every, all the time different things and it's also translated this term as thirst of life because every creature in the world has in a way or another this principle of, of tanha. That is similar to the Sanskrit word kama but has a different connotation. So the question remains easy to say, not to do. If Tanha is what propels us to, to this career of getting more and more, we can um, eliminate the Tanha, the desire of ourselves, and we will become enlightened, and we, we can be uh, living without suffering in that spiritual state. But it's easy to say, but not easy to do. Many times in the Buddha's uh, lifetime, the disciples ask questions to him. And one day, when uh, Buddha was already, already old, but not near to die, Ananda, one of the favorite disciples of him, asked him how they, uh, uh, could they perform this liberation of Tanha. And Buddha, I will read the quote, the quote, said 
Therefore, Ananda, be lamp unto yourself. Rely on yourself and not rely on external help. Hold fast to the truth as a lamp. That means that the solution to our unhappiness and unsatisfaction is not in, in getting some magic receipt or magic uh, medicine from the outside, as doctors used to give the, the people, no? You have a headache, you give a medication. You have fever, we give you medication from the outside. The spiritual and psychological problems are cured from the inside, and the external help is useless if you do not have the ability of enlighten your inner being. And what is that lamp? What is the, um, the, the key to solve the problem? Well, the four of the noble truths that Buddha revealed that day in Sarnath, I was in Sarnath, as I told you, a few days ago. I tried to communicate with that um, in a spiritual or psychological way, but I couldn't because there is there are a lot of tourism now there and the atmosphere is very perturbed. But I, I tried to, to figure there how was the Buddha sit, sat and the pupils and how was that sermon delivered in those ambience. But much have uh, been changed from about 2,500 years to today and now there is full of tourism so the connection is not easy to, to be done. But uh, that day, the four of the noble truth is called the Eightfold Path. That is um, a list of eight things you must do to achieve enlightenment. I will read some. That is uh, right understanding, easy, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right awareness, and finally, samadhi, or right samadhi. And I will focus, to finalize my speech, in the seven of the, of the spec, steps or aspects of this Eightfold um, Path, that is right awareness, that is, at the same time, the first of the seven factors of enlightenment he revealed in another sermon years later. Self-awareness, what is that? From my point of view, self-awareness is to be conscious, to be aware of this process in our mind, and to be aware of how this desire or tanha operate, operates in us, creating truly um, uh, creating expectations and fear that are truly illusions. For example, some hours ago, I was concerned with my daughter about, about some detail of my flight back home. Can be perhaps a detail, nothing to concern seriously. But since I noticed there was a mistake in my ticket, I was uh, thinking in it all the time, having fear of losing a connection and arriving late to home. But when I observed this process into myself, I realized that in a way or another, this thing will be resolved and I will be back home unless I die uh, one day or the day before or, oh, excuse me, or the day after. It's not matter of concern and to ruining s several hours of this morning because having noticed that. This is perhaps a little and objective thing without importance. But I think we magnify all the time little things 
that are li little when we saw them in perspective. And we, all days, are ruining the day. And several days ruin our life because we are always concerned for something. If we observe this process, if we take perspective, per if we are aware of this process, perhaps is the entrance to this state of full awareness uh, of what every theosophical and spiritual book speaks. I don't know what, how is a high state of consciousness. I live very near the floor. Hmm? That's why I think perhaps we can, we should, we, we must start from there, from, from our, devil, uh, our level and being aware of the little things that occupies our whole life. Um, one, once I read some uh, statement of Annie Besant that said that uh, many people try to meditate and sits half an hour or an hour every morning for years without making any progress. So they are discouraged and leave. And she said, that mustn't be surprising for them, shouldn't be surprising for them, because you cannot pretend uh, su any success in meditation if you only devoid to meditation a, a short period in the morning and the rest of the day you are with your mind uh, in a diverse way at high speed thinking on any kind of things. You have to travel the whole journey in a meditating state, contemplating things, no making judgments and not uh, projecting expectations and stressing yourself as we do. That is the same thing with awareness. You have to be aware many times in the day, all the day if possible, and look, just observe without making the effort to control your inner movements, emotional, mental, just to observe. And the, the, just the observation, the, the only observation, probably will quiet your mind and we will be able to go to a deeper step. This morning, in this little example I gave you with my plane ticket, resulted was easy because I was thinking in my talk <laughs> that was about that. We will see what happened in a few hours when I return with, uh, with, uh, to uh, my normal state. But I think that uh, realizing this is the, um, the first uh, little step in a long path from here to the definite enlightenment. And to, to finish, I will read a second quote from, I think it's from one sermon called the Mahaparanirvana Sutra, that was the, um, about the late, the, the, the last days of Buddha. When he was dying, he was aware of that, and the monks were surrounding him, and he said these final words, Behold, O monks, this is my advice to you. All component things in the world are changeable. They are not lasting. Work hard to gain your salvation. Thank you very much. I thank both the speakers. Dr. Esteban says in 2020, this April, it would be the Argentinian section centenary celebrations. You are all cordially invited for that. I thank both uh, the speakers, um, Shikhar and Dr. Esteban, for their 
very um, beautiful ideas that they have given us and to ponder over it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. The session is closed. <laughs>